Water quality, that's the focus of these uh, videos here coming up. Uh, we're going to focus on chemical, physical, um, microbiological, and biological water quality. So hopefully this is informative and helpful. So um, we're going to go over the major areas of water quality. We're going to quickly mention um, how uh, the methods are, are chosen. And um, hopefully this is helpful. All right. So first of all, when we look at water quality, there's three bigger areas that we look at. Chemical, physical, and biological. And biological can be broken down into kind of the ecological aspects, like how well the water supports aquatic life. And then there's also kind of the more human-centric version and when we look at the microbiological water quality and the indicators of water quality that might tell us that the water could make us sick or not. There's also microbiological water quality that's related to aquatic life, but um, they don't spend, we don't spend much time on that in here. All right. So when they determine if water is safe for people to drink in or safe for people to swim in or acceptable for aquatic organisms, which methods do we choose? We can't just, you know, pick any method or anybody who wants to sell you something, their method supposedly works. So in order for methods to be selected, they either have to be EPA approved, if you're looking at compliance with the Clean Water Act or compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act, or in standard methods. And usually those two go hand in hand. So there's a book called Standard Methods. Um, they're probably up to like edition 30-something now. It's published by the American Public Health Association, the Water Environment Federation, and the American Water Works Association. All three of those entities come together to publish the, this ongoing, ever-growing document on how to assess water quality. Um, from everything from how do you test for total chlorine, to how do you test for arsenic, to how do you test for pesticides, um, all that's specified in there. Now, just because you have the book doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it. Some of the technology and some of the stuff that it requires to do some of the tests can be a bit, a bit much. All right. So with regards to water quality determination for like environmental health and public health um, and even ecologic health for like compliance with determining if water is safe for people to swim in or for compliance for determining if there's too much fertilizer in the water or for determining if the water is safe to drink. Some companies, Hawk being one of them, have a lot of these methods that they've developed using their own kits um, that kind of make these EPA accepted or approved or equivalent methods um, simpler. So all the stuff's contained in tubes. They've very carefully packaged things together. And if we were able to have the labs and stuff, we would have done a couple of these where you would use a, a spectrophotometer or a colorimeter to be able to measure various aspects of drinking water quality or even lake water quality. There are examples, I could click on this, there's, a, there's even EPA approved methods that are out there for like microbiology, for enumerating E. coli, we'll talk about that one later. And if somebody's using a method for determining water quality and it's none of the above, then most people may not accept it or it's just good for maybe environmental education and that's it. All right. Why do we test the water? You know, it's pretty, pretty big picture stuff. Well, every water sample is kind of like a unique thumbprint or fingerprint for the water for that particular day. Who makes these determinations? So people have to make determinations for beach water quality. So these are some of my former students doing beach water assessment on Lake Erie. Um, you have to determine if the water is safe for people to swim. We may make water quality determinations to determine if the water is fit for aquatic life. We may make determinations about the water to see if it's going to be more easily treated for drinking water or is it going to be expensive. So how are they able to make the determinations? Well, it first starts off with some sort of way of collecting a sample, either a human being or a person, you know, a human or a person, right, of course. 
Same thing there. But it could also be an auto sampler or something like that. And when the water samples are collected, we're going to look for water, look at maybe water chemistry. Um, we might look at physical parameters and microbiological parameters. So in water chemistry, we tend to break things down into like, what are we looking for? Are we looking for specific chemical elements? Are they inorganic or organic? And organic compounds, they tend to be more oily. These are large carbon chain molecules, things like fats, greases, they have a lot of carbon chains. There are other things as you get less carbon chains, like, uh, like drinking alcohol, like ethanol, those things are more water soluble. So the more carbons that are strung together in a chemical molecule, that means it's going to not dissolve into water as easily. So things like waxes and greases have a lot of carbon and they don't, they don't go in the water very easily. And because of that, that makes oily or fatty things that get into the water really hard to deal with because it's hard to remove them from the water in some cases, especially with like groundwater. And those things can bioaccumulate. They stick to the micro, or not just the microbes, but they stick to like fish and other things in the water. So some things you've heard about PCBs. PCBs have these big ring structures chemically and they have a lot of carbon and they're sticky in the body of things like fish. So they bioaccumulate in fish. And then if birds eat those fish from the water, it bioaccumulates in the birds. So organic compounds are really nasty sometimes in the environment. Organic compounds are anything that has at least one carbon and is in combination with other elements with the exception of like calcium carbonate or carbonates, like baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. So these very, these single carbon things like limestone or carbonate, calcium carbonate, they don't count. Carbon dioxide gas, carbon monoxide gas, they don't count. But big chemicals like um, oils, um, greases, they have a lot of carbons, they're organic compounds. And organic compounds are all the other things like iron, and manganese and lead and chlorine so all right so inorganic ions some of these to know if, you know you don't have to know them for in here but nitrates nitrite total phosphate sulfate ammonium these things don't have carbon in them they're not big oily things and these things like nitrate and phosphates are really important for uh, making things grow like fertilizers so organic compounds have these big carbon 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 ring structures in many cases they have a lot of carbons a lot of herbicides and pesticides mix their chemical into some sort of oily solvent so that it sticks with the plant so when they get into the water they're oily um, gasoline and a lot of the products that go to make gasoline are hydrocarbons. Now, when we look at water quality results, in many cases, the results will sometimes be expressed in like units like PPM, that's parts per million, or PPB, parts per billion. And what this is, is really how many milligrams the weight of the the weight of whatever it is dissolved into a liter of water. So a milligram per liter is a thousand times, like a single milligram is a thousand times bigger than a microgram. It takes a thousand micrograms to equal a milligram. So if something is one part per million, it's like a thousand parts per billion. But they use these different units to make things easier to sometimes read. You could do them all in like parts per, per million, and they'd be like 0 0.0002 parts per million might mean something like, I don't know, 20 or 200 parts per billion. So sometimes instead of writing something like that, 0 0.004 milligrams per liter, 
thou might write four micrograms per liter, just to make it easier to read. All right, so you might be familiar with pH. You've probably learned about pH at different times in your career or your education. And, and pH, um, people use it from everything from pool chemistry to um, what you're drinking or eating uh, to how your stomach's doing. And we use it a lot in water. So pH, more hydrogen ions, makes it more acidic, which lowers the pH. So a lot of acids, they have chemical formulas that are like HCl, or that's hydrochloric acid, or HNO3, that's nitric acid, or hydrofluoric acid, that's HF. They all have H in them. They have a lot of hydrogen in them. More hydrogen in the water or in the acid solution means more acidic. Hydroxyl groups like OH, we think of things like oxyclean, hydroxyl, oxyclean, sodium hydroxide, um, things that have a lot of hydroxyl groups. These are often sometimes used in drain cleaners. Um, so more hydroxyl groups, more OH groups, those things tend to be more basic or alkaline high pHs. And the pH can go from 0 all the way up to 14 and it's on like a log scale. So, you know, if you're familiar with like how earthquakes are rated, you know, uh, an earthquake that's like a 5 on the Richter scale is a thousand times, you know, stronger than like a Richter scale of, of 2. Um, that's a threefold difference. So we'll, we'll talk about that here uh, right now. So going from a pH of 7 to a pH of 8 means that the water is not, it's one pH unit different, but there's a tenfold change in the hydroxyl concentration. We've added 10 times the amount of hydroxyl, and that also means we've taken away 10 times the amount of H's. We have to remember, water is H2O. That's uh, two hydrogens and an oxygen. Sometimes the oxygen and the hydrogen are bound. Sometimes the hydrogen is free. Sometimes it's the other way around. And there's always a variation in how much of the hydrogen is bound, how much of the hydroxyl is bound. And that variation is our pH. So H2O. Here's our H. H O. There's our H two O. So a pH of seven to a pH of eight means that one pH unit change means ten times more basic. Going from seven to nine is a two pH change means it's a hundred times more basic or more alkaline. We could go the other way around too. A water sample with a pH of 5. That's two pH units different. 10 to the second power. 10 times 10 is 100. So there's 100 times more hydrogen in the pH of 5 than a pH of 7. It's 100 times more acidic. Okay, a water sample with a pH of 4.5 versus a pH of 7.5. So how many pH units are different there? three okay now the three change in pH how much more hydrogen or how much more acidic is that 10 times 10 times 10 10 to the third power it's a thousand times more acidic than that okay hopefully that's pretty easy we'll do some examples here um, not examples let you see some examples right so acids like battery acid, really acidic. It's almost just pure H. There's very little, you know, all the hydroxyl is free. There's not, not much. Drain cleaner, a lot of hydroxyl. Very little free hydrogen. We've got lemon juice, 
grapefruit. We got our Mountain Dew down in this range. Coffee. All right, pure water is a seven. Seawater is an eight. Baking soda is a nine. People tend to be able to drink stuff in this range. Our stomachs are actually quite acidic. Um, so people tend to be able to tolerate drinking fluids anywhere between like two and a half to three all the way up to, you know, eight and a half or nine, like alkaline waters and stuff like that. So quick review, a pH of seven versus a pH of five. It's how many times more acidic? So 10 times 10 is 100. 10 to the second power. 10 to the third power here, 1,000. We evaluate water with respect to what? Physical, chemical, and biological. When we get our results um, from our testing. We use what type of test? Typical book, standard methods. All right. Review. You know, some of these I'll just give you guys on a quiz or something um, rather than show them all here in this video. So I'm going to pause this here and make a new video on the next section. The next section we're going to cover more about water quality, dissolved oxygen, biochemical oxygen demand, and all that. So um, if you have any questions, you can email me at jason.marion at eku.edu, and I'm going to stop the video now.